Dan Lanning right now has something in common with Homer Simpson and uh, might be good news for the Ducks. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making it your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Keep liking, keep commenting, keep subscribing, keep sending your questions, and I appreciate all of you out there who have done all of that, who will continue to do all of that. I really do appreciate all of you. Today's episode brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has covered this season with more props, odds and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. You notice I've got the suit jacket, the button down, down on took the tie off i had a college basketball broadcast earlier tonight as i record this late at night and uh, glad i did because a certain piece of news dropped here that i'm starting my show with and i thought you know i i could i could go into a uh, a regular shirt and you know if this looks too formal if you don't like it i'll never do it again but Homer Simpson in The Simpsons Movie, which is a hilarious film by the way one of my brother and i's favorites of all time has a uh, a speech that he gives where he comes out and says, no, we are staying. We have a great life here in Alaska and we're never going back to America again. And he slams the door and says, I have spoken. Well, Dan Lanning and Homer Simpson now have something in common in, in that sense because they have both spoken about a potential shift or change. There's been a lot of rumors, a lot of talks, speculation, message boards, SI pieces, yada, yada, all, all this sort of stuff. And I have it on good authority that the interest in Dan Lanning from Auburn is very real and that there was at least some mutual interest. Now, Dan Lanning was asked about this yesterday as you listen to the show, and he had a number of comments that I think overall are good for Duck fans as it pertains to him staying with Oregon. He should get a raise at the end of the year. He probably will. So will Dillingham if the season continues on the trajectory that it's currently on. But I, I think the most telling quotes in in the midst of everything he said was, the grass is not always greener. It's pretty damn green here in Eugene. More on that in a moment. He also said, I want to be here in Eugene as long as Eugene will have me. I think history maybe shows that this is a great place to be and not a great place to leave. Now, this will put a lot of Oregon fans at ease because it's what they want to hear. And am I encouraged by this statement as it pertains to the idea that Lanning could could leave to Auburn? Yes. Am I 100% solidified that he would never consider it no matter what sort of offer in, in terms of a contract they came at him with? No. Because if you're Dan Lanning, you don't know what the future is actually going to hold. So that interest in the Auburn job may actually be there. But Lanning doesn't know if that's going to happen. He can't possibly know because nobody knows what's going to happen on that front. And from what I understand, he's a top two or three target for them. But Lane Kiffin is number one. It looks like that's who Auburn will go after the hardest. But if you're Dan Lanning, you can't leave any window, any cracks, anything ajar to the idea that well, you know, yeah, I was really, really interested in that. Because then, if you don't get it, and you're still Oregon's head coach, then you're in trouble with fan base and alumni. And then your stuff can start to spiral out of control from there. So, this is simultaneously what he should say, and what we would want to hear him say, because I didn't think it was a very wishy-washy statement. But, I think a lot of fans will look at it and say, oh, well, phew, he's staying. Well, I think you can find a lot of statements from coaches about wanting to be at a place and it being really, really good. But I did have a couple thoughts on uh, on that particular front and, and a couple of great stats. I'm not here to tell you that I saw this quote and thought, oh, well, he's he's definitely going to stay. Nor did I watch or did I see it and say, oh, well, he's you know just saying this for covering. He's definitely going to go to Auburn. I'm just saying you have to take everything coaches say with a grain of salt and filter through it. And I'm glad that he said a lot of great things about Oregon. I think the fact that he mentioned his kid having moved a lot is a really good sign. And the things he said about the program, I think, are are encouraging. But that doesn't mean that it's solidified. So that's the thought on that. 
it, it dropped late last night. Again, this, of course, coming out this episode on Tuesday morning. So um, I, I'm sure a lot of you saw it. I figure some of you might ask questions, and it's definitely worth addressing. I, I did want to go over the specific comments he made, and then later we're getting to college football playoff conversation because Oregon got a lot of help over the weekend. So he had a comment about the grass is not always greener. It's pretty damn green here in Eugene, and this is maybe not a great place to leave. He's right about that. Now, whether or not he will heed that advice, time will tell. It seems like he will, but is there a guarantee? No, there's not a guarantee in anything. Nothing is truly ever fully guaranteed. Now, I did remember about the week before Mario left when he was given his press conference. I think it was after the Pac-12 championship game, and he was asked about the Miami rumors. It was not as forceful, from what I recall, of a commitment to the Ducks as what Lanning gave here. So if you want to take that as a positive sign, I think that's fair. But... Uh, th- this notion that that Lanning put out there that you know it's not always greener and coaches who leave have had uh, middling results. Yeah, he's 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 right about that. And here are some great stats to to back that up. And look, whether or not every coach going forward will will see and understand that, including Lanning, time will tell. But here are the facts: Willie Tagger to Oregon. With an injured Justin Herbert, by the way, they would have been much. They probably would have been at least a nine, maybe ten win team if Herbert stays healthy. Burmeister was abysmal, but they ended the year seven and five with Taggart at the helm. Everywhere else, Willie Taggart's been sixty three and seventy three. Mario Cristobal thirty five and thirteen at Oregon, won a lot of games, thirty one and fifty two elsewhere. Chip forty six and seven at Oregon. 26 and 26 everywhere else. Now, those stats do need some context because if you're coming from a non Power Five school like Mario had been in his head coaching career at FIU or Taggart at South Florida or Western Kentucky, and that takes a lot of time. But the fundamental statement there, I think, does hold a lot of truth to it. And, and I talked about this a lot over the summer and during the coaching search and whatnot that I wasn't particularly nervous during this coaching search that ultimately ended up with Dan Lanning because Oregon's had two losing seasons in this century. This century, they've had two losing seasons. They had one back in the early 2000s and then Helfrich in 2016. And because the standard has been reset compared to what it was in the 20th century, Helfrich was then fired. And by the way, Mark Helfrich got an offensive coordinator job in the NFL briefly, but is now an analyst working at Fox. He does a lot of games with, with Noah Eagles. So on, on FS1, he hasn't been given a head coaching opportunity, but he was able to succeed at Oregon. And and the idea that Oregon is a job where anybody could win. I don't know about anybody per se, but I see a lot of different coaches doing it. And then they go away from Oregon. That's been, raising its profile in the Pac-12. That's been a really good program and now looking like an excellent program. And they have a lot of resources. They have a lot of fan support. They have a great administration. There are a lot of things that go into having that run of success. I think it's a testament to the job the Oregon community, fans included, by the way, have done to put it at a place where they have seen more head coaches than a lot of fans would like in the last, you know, seven, eight years. But they've all won, and then they go elsewhere, and they see, as Lanning said, the grass is not always greener. I think that's enough of that for the day, but, uh, (laughs) boy, the Ducks got some help over the weekend. And uh, that's kind of what they needed, wasn't it? Isn't that what I talked about? Yeah? No? Maybe? Yeah, the answer is definitely yes. All the college football playoff talk you need after our mind this episode brought to you by Nissan. This week's thrilling moment in college football is brought to you by Nissan. The thrilling designs from the new lineup from Nissan are intended to power drivers and vehicles as capable as the driver themselves. When I think of unbelievable abilities on the field for this week's thrilling moment, it has to be... Oh, there's so many plays to choose from from that Colorado game. I mean, my goodness. My goodness. There were so many chances. Was it Josh Connerly's touchdown? Was it Gonzo's two picks? Was it Noah Sewell's touchdown? Was it the throwback? I don't know. I feel like that gif of Larry David. Like, I don't know. 
Yeah, I'm going Bucky Irving to Bo Nix. I love me a little quarterback throwback from the running back on a speed option toss. That was perhaps the most thrilling moment. But man, Josh Connerly, a big fella touchdown. One of my closest buddies who's a Duck fan was an offensive lineman when we were growing up. And he loves him some big fella scores. And um, yeah, I, I think he'd be a little disappointed that I did not pick that but I just the throwback it was so awesome it was a great throw a good catch and everything and that is this week's Nissan thrilling moment this segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles pursue what thrills you in the all-new frontier armada or pathfinder today available now at nissanusa.com so Dan Lanning much like Homer Simpson has spoken and now we can turn our attention to where Oregon sits in the college football playoff race. And it's pretty nice, 10 weeks into the season, to still be able to talk about that. And Oregon has to win out. We all know that. But, man, they're playing some good football. And they are going to need a lot of help. Yeah, well, a lot of help was given. To people who, you know, doubt the Pac-12's ability to get into the playoff, specifically Oregon's, but frankly anyone in the Conference of Champions, which my beginning expansion team, go check out Locked On Pack 12, where I uh, will talk about that on today's show. But they, uh, they're they suddenly getting that sort of help. And it was a crazy idea to some. Pack 12's not getting to the playoff. I heard it from a lot of people. Oregon's not getting Pack 12's not getting in. Well, that path that had so many obstacles and roadblocks in it, it's like you're driving along in Mario Kart. And you had a wall here and a wall here and your buddy's driving right here. And then all of a sudden, it's like you threw a mushroom or an ability. Sorry, I haven't played Mario Kart in a long time. And you cleared a path. Just a little. It's not wide open, but the path is starting to clear up. It's starting to get there. And look at what happened over the weekend. Clemson should be out of the top ten. They never should have been in the top four. They went on the road to Notre Dame and they got thumped. They don't have a good quarterback situation. Find me the college football playoff team that's had quarterback questions. I'll wait. There hasn't been one, at least not that I know of. Maybe there has been. Let me know in the YouTube comments. I've been wrong before. They didn't go lose to Notre Dame. They got smacked by Notre Dame. The Irish are not that good. Are they improving? Sure. You know what else I know about Notre Dame? On that same field, they lost to Stanford. Come on. I mean, come on. Clemson's got to be out of the top 10. That was borderline Georgia level. Because the Georgia loss looks bad on paper. At least Georgia's the best team in the country. Notre Dame is not. And they got smacked. They should be out of the top 10. So that's one domino that that had to fall. You needed Clemson to lose. Because the ACC is not very good. One loss Clemson versus a one loss Oregon. Conference champion. That's got to be Oregon. I I feel great about Oregon getting in over the Tigers, who were already operating, it seemed, on thin ice. And notice with their schedule and Ohio State's schedule, they were behind the Buckeyes. Because the ACC is the weakest of the Power Five conferences. I think the committee knows that, and I hope that's reflected in the rankings that are coming out on, on Tuesday night. LSU, how about my hey, Gold Tigers? I mean, they don't have Ed Orgeron anymore, but, um, you know, Brian Kelly and his weird forced Southern drawl. <laughs> Look, he's not my favorite guy in the world. He just, he's not exactly a warm, fuzzy, likable character. There's nothing that really that likable about him, except for the part where he beats Nick Saban in year one. LSU can't get into the playoff. They've got two losses. Florida State, although they thumped Miami, are, is not that good of a team. They might finish in the top 25 at the end of the year. But if you're LSU, you can't have two losses. They got housed by Tennessee, and they lost to Florida State, who's not that good. They're playing good football right now, though. But with two losses, they can't get into the playoff. You know who else can? Alabama. Alabama is not going to be in the college football playoff this year. At least they shouldn't be. Maybe the committee would break precedent and say, well, LSU is playing so well, and they do this, that, and the other thing. But the way I see it, you're going to have enough teams in that conversation. The Big Ten champion, probably going to be undefeated. Big Ten's not that good. I think Penn State is a good team. I think Penn State is a good team. Those wins by Ohio State and and Michigan, I think they're impressive. Penn State's a good team. Everybody else in the Big Ten? Like, you knew the Illini were going to run out of steam. They lost to Michigan State. Yeah, Sparty's not very good. 
Minnesota, eh, Wisconsin, eh, it's, it's like it's a bunch of middling teams. They're doing a Pac-12 in a sense where they're cannibalizing one another. But the Big Ten champ is probably going to be undefeated. But because the Big Ten is also not that good, that's good news for Oregon. Because a one-loss non-Big Ten champion who's 11-1, and one, probably not going to get in over a 12-1 and one Oregon team. A lot of help right there. A lot of help right there. You got some two-loss teams. You got the Big Ten not being that good. And, uh, oh, by the way, Georgia beat Tennessee. And I said earlier on on the pod last week or week before, day before, I don't even know. Everything blurs together at this point. The, The best news for Oregon is Georgia to continue to win out and look really good doing it. Final score, 27 to 13. Did anybody who watched that game felt like it was ever that close? I didn't. Now, it's not 49 to 3. And it still looks better on paper for Tennessee because it was better on paper. They scored 13 points. They only allowed 27. Oregon only scored three and allowed 49. I know I'm just repeating statistics, but even though stylistically there were some similarities in that Georgia's much better than Tennessee, it's still a disadvantage for Oregon. And another loss for Tennessee would probably be good. Here's more good news for the Ducks. TCU... Didn't look that great against Texas Tech. They're the comeback kids. I tell you what, their game against Texas this week is going to be fascinating. I think you could see the Longhorns build a 17-point lead and then lose by 10. I really think that could happen. Because Texas, in the second half, is dreadful. And TCU, when they're trailing, are maybe the greatest team in all of college football. I'm exaggerating a little bit there. But the Horn Frogs have been otherworldly when they're trailing. They've, they've been behind in... I think like five games this year, and they've come back to win by double digits. It's ridiculous. They did it to Kansas State. They did it to Texas Tech. They did it to Oklahoma State. Like, it's just, were they trailing in that game? I don't know. I'm getting my Big 12 matchups all all crossed up here. But you get the point. TCU has been that sort of team all season long. But they did not look impressive against Texas Tech. And going into those initial rankings, or coming out of them, I guess I should say, the committee told you they didn't have a great deal of respect for TCU, even though their resume was unquestionably better than Alabama's. But they did not totally respect them. So when TCU plays a middling team, like Texas Tech, which is a middle-of-the-road Big 12 school, who Oregon plays next year in the non-conference, by the way, in Lubbock. Should be an interesting game, but right now, looks like Oregon's better. Anyway. Cross that bridge when we come to it. The committee is telling you that TCU, like Clemson, is on thin ice. And what TCU doesn't have, that Clemson did have before that blowout loss against Notre Dame, was institutional brand respect. So the Horn Frogs have an extra obstacle to overcome. And if they lose to Texas this week, they could still get into the Big 12 championship game. But the other thing, too, is they, they, it feels unsustainable. I talk about this a lot on, on Locked on Pac-12. I was discussing with regards to USC's offense, and, and I was getting some pushback. But when I watch USC's offense, I feel like sometimes they're not just relying on Caleb Williams because he's a great player, but they're relying on him to make an unbelievably spectacular play over and over again. I've never felt that way about Oregon's offense this year. I've never felt that way about UCLA's offense this year. They they just are able to play within the structure of the offense and be great players, but they don't have to do the amazing, the spectacular, the unbelievable all the time. But that's what TCU feels like with their schedule and how they're playing out. Can you really fall behind over and over and over again and just keep coming back and winning? I think their offense is really good. That defense is Swiss cheese. That defense is absolutely Swiss cheese. So what are the college football playoff rankings going to look like when they come out? I've got thoughts. I've got a full prediction, which I'll tell you about after I remind you about our friends at Bet Online, the number one source for betting sports and stats and news and analysis and everything you could possibly need. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to basketball to soccer, World Cup upcoming, love that, and esports. We've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online. 
as well, in addition to this one that you all enjoy, or at least I hope you do. We're always the fastest and easiest way to getting your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Alrighty, so the playoff committee is going to come out with their second rankings the day that this episode drops. Come out later tonight. If you're listening to this later, they've already come out and you can see, whoa, Spencer, you were right. Or, Spencer, you were way off. What in the world were you thinking? Alrighty. I think George is going to be number one. Hot take alert. Yeah, I know. Can't believe it. Um, I just, I, I, I molded over and I just had to come to a really difficult conclusion. That was it. Yeah, I think George is going to be number one. Yeah, shocker. I know. We're going to have a playoff this year without Bama or Clemson. How strange is that? It's the way it should be, by the way. And why I like 14 playoff model, because in a 12-team model, both teams are going to get in in the future. Just throwing that out there. Anyway, um, not a big expansion guy. Spencer McLaughlin, on the record, anti-college football playoff expansion. Number two will be Ohio State. Ohio State did not look great in a win at Northwestern, but the winds were howling at 30-some-odd miles per hour, and the rain was coming down, and... Look, it wasn't impressive, but no team has a perfect season. Georgia is the best team in the country. Struggle with Missouri. Missouri stinks. Just the way it goes sometimes. And Northwestern was a big underdog and gave it. They were tied 7-7 at the half as a 38-point underdog. Pretty crazy. Like, imagine if Oregon had been tied at the half with Colorado. How would we be feeling? Yeah, not great. But Ohio State, still a really good football team. They do a lot of things well. Michigan will be number three. I think Tennessee will be number four and TCU will be five. This goes back to what I was talking about earlier. TCU has got no institutional brand respect with the college football playoff committee. We saw that in the initial rankings. And they're also not believing in them long term, which plays into how they vote as well sometimes. Because they're just behind in seemingly every single game. And so as a result, I think you'll have Tennessee before you'll have TCU be five. And the Horned Frogs, I think, eventually will play themselves out of being there. And that opens the door for Oregon. But, 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 that's an if. And the, the, the if here is if Tennessee loses another game. I mean, if Tennessee loses another game and you have a couple of two lost teams that are up there in the top 10 in LSU and Tennessee, then the, the path is wide open for Oregon. Because you could have a Big 12 champ that is not a zero or one loss TCU. That would take the Big 12 out of it. You would have Ohio State or Michigan's winner being the Big 10 champion and that team in. You'd have Georgia in. Who's left? Who is left? That's why Oregon got a lot of help. And by the way, a couple of you were asking, like, could Oregon beat this team? Could Oregon beat that team? The, the best case scenario for Oregon is if somehow they get into the playoff and get up to the three seed. I'll take my chances with Ohio State, who's really good and better than last year in a couple of ways. Don't want to see the Bulldogs again. Let somebody else have at them. Just for fun, rest of my prediction. But Oregon could beat TCU. I think Oregon could beat Tennessee. They could at least hang with Tennessee. Maybe the Vols offense would be too much, but I don't know if you've watched Oregon's offense recently. They're really, really good. And I I think Michigan, Ohio State, I think those would be really good games. Oregon might be an underdog, but could they win? Yes. I I don't see how you could go from 49 to 3, even though it's week one and they've made a lot of improvements. So too have the Bulldogs. I, I, I don't think you can beat Georgia. But anybody else that's in the playoff discussion... Yeah, I mean, Oregon can certainly beat TCU. Oregon might be favored against TCU. I, I would not be surprised at that at all. If you put them on a neutral field, I wouldn't be shocked if the Ducks are favored in that game. It'd be a good game, high scoring, competitive, as I think it would be with a lot of these teams. But Michigan, Ohio State, I think Ohio State's a step above Michigan this year. I think the Wolverines are, are, are really good. I think Ohio State is excellent. I think Ohio State, Georgia is the national championship to college football fans kind of deserve because I think that could be a really, really good football game. But just for fun, rest of my predictions, I think Oregon's going to come in here at six. I think it'll be behind TCU because they have the loss and TCU does not. They'll be behind Tennessee because their loss is better than Oregon's. I think USC will be seven, LSU eight, Bama nine, Ole Miss 10, 
I think Clemson will be at 11, which will be ridiculous because they should be like 17, but whatever. Utah at 13 and UCLA just above them at 12. Why did I go in reverse order there? I don't really know. Just kind of happened and uh, and played out that way. Kind of like wearing the, the suit jacket and the button down. Again, if that was too much, let me know. And we'll, we'll keep it casual, but I don't know. It was just kind of comfortable. And I thought, you know what? I could change into a shirt, but it's late and I got to get the pod done and let's just get it rolling. And th- there's never harm in looking good, right? At least I hope not. Appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.